1 Timothy chapter 4, 1 Timothy chapter 4, and uh, I'm going to uh, preach a little bit different type of message today. I did a study on something I thought was real interesting, and uh, it's about our young people. The title of my message this morning is, How Long Will You Stay a Child or We Allow You To? And uh, I think what we have today, uh, we have a system that's trying to create everlasting youth. And as a result of that, there's a lot of non-responsibility and uh, there's a lot of things that's going on as a result of that. I want to talk about that a little bit. 1 Timothy 4.12 says this here, Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, and in purity. And I want to talk a little bit about that today if I could. Society thinks that our young people and our young adults, that they're just not mature enough. They think that they're just going to be kind of goofy, silly, and kind of run away from responsibility. Uh, our young people, they say, are dumb about politics, economy, the faith, community action. Uh, all the, our young people want to do today is hang out at the mall, waste money, gab on Facebook, TV, texting, listening to music, fun and entertainment without much achievement. And of course, we say to that, according to God, hogwash, amen? The Bible states this in Psalm 139, verse 14. The kids learned it this week. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, that my soul knoweth right well. Now, we have a great God who created us, and he created us all uh, just the way he wanted us to be, and he's got something great for us if we will just follow him, Amen? You never know, our young people, somebody might be president. I hope that you are one day, and uh, you help us out a little bit, okay? <laughs> Amen. Supreme Court Justice, a teacher, a CEO, a business owner, an author. It's hard telling what we might have in this building right here. Most people have low expecta expectations of young people today. Even in churches, they think young people don't have the adult level of spiritual interest or adult attention spans. They think that our young people, they can't handle instruction in Christian living and uh, they just need to be entertained constantly. They think they need youthful leaders only. Uh, they have their music, they have their leader and the leader must understand the latest lingo or have tattoos all over his body in order to be able to relate. They think that adult leaders have to come down to our kids' level so that they can be relevant and be able to minister to them. And, of course, we say, no, it's time for young people to come up and join us. Amen? Amen. And I believe that's what God would have. They need to stop thinking of themselves as second-class citizens in the church, consider themselves as full-fledged full members of the body of Christ, an American citizen, and help us to make a huge dent in this community in which we live. It's time to start living an adult life right now. And you say, what do you mean by that? Well, first of all, an adult has his own relationship with God. It's time for young people to embrace the gospel of Jesus Christ and then have their own relationship and their spiritual growth is totally dependent upon them. They have to stop living their parents' faith and practice and start living God's faith and practice. And I believe God would have young people to do that. And they have to understand something. It's up to them, their spiritual life. It's up to them the rest of their life. It's not dependent upon mom or dad or church. It's dependent upon your individual self. Amen? And not only that, secondly, an adult takes responsibility for his or her actions. Uh, uh, he wants to be what he should be and do. And he doesn't invent excuses or, you know, for being underperforming or complain about the bad conditions. He tries to make the conditions in which he's in at that moment better than it is to do his best. Three, an adult decides not to, take, not to be a taker or receiver, but a giver. In other words, he sees himself as a producer and not a consumer. Amen? As Jesus was a servant, ditto. And that's what God wants young people to be. Uh, he asked himself this question, how can I spend tomorrow, okay, 
How can I spend tomorrow in such a way that when I look back, I won't be embarrassed, but I'll be thankful and not regretful. Amen? An adult does something else. An adult, he lives with the conscientious sense of duty. That word duty, it's not a word that's thought of a whole lot today. It's the opposite of the idea for looking out for number one, yourself. Duty is a responsibility in the world around you, looking more for your responsibilities than your rights. Amen? As believers and as citizens, we have God's word. We have our country's laws that protect our rights. But unfortunately, we live in a very selfish time when most people are majoring on their rights and minoring on <laughs> what? Their responsibilities. Exactly right. Everyone wants his entitlement today at a, as a citizen and as a believer, but few want to know what their duties are. Huh? Duty conscious people look for ways to be helpful in their family, their church, their employment, their community, and even in their country. Anymore in our culture, our priorities are upside down. We work as much as we have to just in order to survive instead of producing. We worship entertainment and pleasure. Let me give you an example of that. Here's a couple lists. First list, do you know who Andrew Luck is? Tim Tebow, Tiger Woods, Jennifer Lopez, Joshua, who sang on American Idol, Tom Cruise. Well, he's in the news lately, isn't he? <laughs> uh, Kim Kardashian. And most people would say, yeah, we know these people. We know them. We know their names and everything. But let me say something about those people. What they do is they play for a living. That's what they do. They play for a living. But here's another list. Do you know these fellows? Christian Bernard, Jonas Salk, Alexander Fleming. Christian Bernard, he performed the first successful heart transplant, human transplant. Jonas Salk, he created the Salk vaccine that stopped crippling polio. Fleming, he developed an antibiotic penicillin, saving millions of lives. Now, which one of those lists contributed more to mankind? The ones that are playing or the ones that worked at something? And it's the ones who worked at something. You see, we've become a nation defined more by our playing, entertainment. We want to see our football, our basketball. Boy, it's killing me to see all these big contracts these guys are signing right now. I don't know why. When everything is so bad and they argue and they go up in the 50s and the 100 millions, it's unbelievable to me. You know that? They all pay a school teacher or something like that. Amen. But we want to see our football, our basketball, our baseball, track and field, gymnastics, swimming, fishing, hockey, softball, golf, and so on, than by our work. Fun and games allows adults to be able to take their childhood into their adulthood. Amen? The fifth thing, an adult steps up to his potential in God and his life. I believe God is calling young people and young adults today to become adults. Let me remind you of some things. This is just a recent craze the last 50 years. Let's see what it used to be. John Quincy Adams, the sixth president of the, our country, drilled with the Massachusetts militia during the Revolutionary War. He was eight years old. At 11, he served as secretary to his father, John Adams, who, by the way, was the second president of the United States. John Adams, an envoy to France at that time. At age 14, Congress appointed him secretary to America's envoy to Russia. 14 years old, appointed by Congress. Thomas Edison, inventor of many inventions, but especially the light bulb. And uh, he didn't wait to grow up. At age 12, he worked on the railroad. He rebuilt an old printing press, and he published a newspaper in the railroad baggage car, and then he would sell that to the passengers. Huh? They fired him later on because he created a fire in that baggage car for, for mixing chemicals. He was working on a project. <laughs> David Farragut, the first admiral in the U.S. Navy, went to sea when he was nine years old. 
he was uh, in the war of 1812, his ship captured a British warship, Farragut. He was commanded to sail that from the west coast of South Africa to Boston. And he was 12 years old at that time as the commander. On another ship, another war, Calvin Graham distinguished himself on the USS South Dakota in World War II. In, ba in battle, Japanese artillery hit his ship. It got on fire. Graham was seriously wounded. But despite his injuries, he not only took part in the fire control efforts, but also he rescued several of his wounded sailors who would have otherwise burned to death. Graham was awarded the Purple Heart for his wounds, the Bronze Star for his heroism, and a discharge for lying. During his recovery, they discovered that he had falsified his enlistment papers and he was only 12 years of age. Isn't that amazing? Benjamin Franklin, statesman, diplomat, scientist, philanthropist, and so on, he went to school for only two years. He had a publishing career under a pen name. As a teenager, he would slip his articles under the editor's door and the article and the editor would begin to leave him money, but that's how he got started in that. Only a few years ago, young people routine, routinely carried serious responsibility before the marrying age. Young people learned early in life that the world did not revolve around them. And they learned they could handle that. I don't, give, we, I don't believe we give our kids credit sometimes. They can do it. We try to baby them and protect them and live our lives through our children. That has to stop as a parent. Let them go. They need to grow up. Amen? That's good preaching, Jim. I'm sorry. What happened, our government began to view and the church follow that all this American self-sufficiency and independence with disapproval. And the reason why is when independent people think for themselves, that makes them harder to govern because they can't be hoodwinked or in church controlled. You see, this was the threat for those concerned with changing our public opinion in favor of socialism, bigger government, and better control. The process of growing up has changed in our country. Lots of people wanted to control the rest of the population. In order to do this, they had to make people childlike and irresponsible. Childhood had to be artificially extended so that its citizens would be easier to be led or misled. Frederick Engels, a communist friend of Karl Marx, stated in the Communist Manifesto, remove people from their roots, they can easily be swayed then to our view. Engels was right, and our country proves it because of the last 50 years. We're going towards socialism, you see. It's worked with our young people. Most in the public now accepts as normal an American youth lifestyle that keeps kids up in their, now get this, that keeps kids uh, locked up in schools and universities for most of their lives. Their productive hours away from the challenge of real work and a real world. 50% plus today in our country, live on entitlements and still, instead of pulling their straps up themselves. Amen? <laughs> Professor said, it's taking, wow, 50% longer to decide on a career's direction. That may, they just keep them going and going. Well, you need this, you need this, and you need this. And we're keeping our youth in an artificial environment. Instead of the real world, kids are not growing up doing grown-up work, thinking about grown-up things or issues. Our kids today do live in a matrix that's created by our own system. They used to be kids wanted to be adults. They wanted to grow up, take their places in the real world. Back in my early days, 
the adults, many of them were teens. Today, one can be a child as an adult, <laughs> yeah, which seems to be teens and 20-somethings. And they're still not supporting themselves. I, what do you think's going on? Today, government and education has crea created a young person called an adolescent. Now get this who has the freedom of an adult to do what he pleases, but has the responsibility of a child. Is that not true or not? It's freedom from responsibility is the third leading cause for suicide among ages of 15 to 24 today. I believe with all my heart God's offering you a different way. Skip your adolescence and grow up. Amen? Amen. And parents allow them to grow up. <laughs> Decide to grow up now and take responsibility for your life. It means you're taking responsibility for your actions. You're determined to amount to something rather than just play the youth life all the time. It means you're placing your life, yourself at God's disposal. It means that, God, whatever you have for my life, I'm going in that direction for you, for your honor, for your glory. I'm going to stop being so dependent on mom and dad. I'm going to start trying to make a way for myself. Huh? Amen? And you parents need to allow them to do that. God called a young man when he needed a prophet in Israel. He called a young lad by the name of Samuel. God called a young teen to suffer so he'd be, he'd be in position to save his nation, Israel, Joseph. God called a young teen to defeat a giant when the other older soldiers wouldn't fight. And that was David. God called a young lad to become king because the older kings were idolatrous and evil. So he called a good king up and his name was Josiah and he was just a lad. God called a young lady to help stop genocide of the Jews, Esther. God called four teen boys to test the enemy's fire and lions in Daniel and the three Hebrew boys. God called two babies in the midst of their mother's womb to be prophets. And their names Jeremiah and John the Baptist. God called a young teen girl to birth God's son, the savior of the world. And her name was Mary. And then Paul told a young man by the name of Timothy, don't allow anybody to despise, to discredit, to do away with your youth because you can do great things in your youth. Huh? He says, don't let them despise that. As a matter of fact, what you should do is be an example. And they see your example here. And because of that example... They won't say anything about your youth. And he says that example right there. He says, be thou an example of the believers in word. That's your conversation, the way you speak, and your public speaking, your private speaking. You control, you speak with grace. Then it says in conversation, that's your conduct, your behavior. Don't be a hypocrite. Go all out for God and live for God. And then he says in charity, that means in love for others. You have a caring, compassionate nature when you see other people in need. And then he says, in spirit, that's your spiritual character that's visible and observable by other people. You demonstrate your faithfulness and your trustworthiness to others. And then he says, in purity. That means you're you have your life disciplined. You're living a morally clean, pure, godly life with the opposite sex. You're not going by what society says you ought to do. I just read last night on the internet that they had to order 100,000 condoms for the Olympic Games. Huh? They say it's a big sex fest. Yeah, isn't that amazing? 
Our country has completely lost its morals. We've turned our back on the absolute truth of God. And when you begin to exclude God and turn your back on his absolutes, there's only one thing left, that which comes from your flesh. And that's why the standards and the morals continue to drop, drop, drop. And let me say something to you. God, he might be doing it now, but God has to judge America. I always remember Billy Graham years ago. He says, if God did not judge America, he would have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. Amen? Amen? And that's true. And we're seeing the, co the collapse of our country, our government, our system, of what we have always respected. But in the midst of it, the number one target is Christians and Jews. Those are the targets of our country. Uh, Connie has a sheet, a list of all the things for the last several years here that they've done to take away and fight against Christian, Christians and Christianity. And it continues to go on, and we just go hum home. We're just walking into the gas chambers nonchalantly. And it's going to take somebody who has enough gumption and I believe it's going to have to be some young people. I think the older people have lost this country, forgive me. We've lost our Christian testimony as older people. Not all, thank God, there are some, good. But overall, you see, what we, we've watered down our message, we've watered down our churches, we've done all these things rather than teaching kids how to stand up on truth so that when they do, if they do go to college, you don't have to, but if you do, you do. Russ Limbaugh never went to college. He's doing halfway decent, I think. I think he makes about $30 million a year, okay? But all I'm saying is that you don't know where God wants to take you. And I believe it's up to our young people and young adults. If anybody turns around, you're going to have to be the ones that turn it around. Us older people, we're too passive. We're too fat and satisfied. We're too comfortable. We like the way it is. We like our homes. We like our cars. We like our restaurants. We Could I talk a little bit here? Amen. Huh? You see, we're too worldly. The things that matter to us is the cares of this world. That's where most of us are. Not all, thank God. But you'd have to agree with me. Most of Christianity, that's exactly the way they are. And God's looking out and he's going to and fro. He says, is there anybody who will stand up for me now? And I personally believe it will be those young people. Those people who are not controlled by all these things yet. That's why they say 85% of people who come to Christ, they do it uh, 15 years of age and under. Why is that? Because the older we get, the more callous we become or more custom or more familiar with the things of the world and we like it too much that we don't want to give that up so we don't come to Christ. But the same thing happens in our Christian walk. We like the things of this world more than the things of Christ. Why is it that a pastor has to stand up and say, listen, you say you're a Christian now. It's time to study your Bible. And some people have been saved for years and they still don't study their Bible. Huh? You know, they're 50 year old babies. Isn't that true? Why is that? And I believe with all my heart that we are more concerned with the cares of this world than we are about our relationship with God and the impact and influence we could actually have in society. God help there be somebody. Though everybody else says no, I'm going to be one. Amen? Amen? I refuse to go off into the sunset. Amen? Amen? Just taking it easy and gliding in. I want God to, when he calls me home, to say, Jim, it's time to come. I thought, man, I was, I was doing that. You see what I was doing? I want to finish that. I want to be on the firing line until he calls me home. Amen. Is there anybody here that wants to do that too? Yes. 
Father, we just come to you. Thank you for your love for us. And Lord, I just want to share this about young people. I just believe young people have been sold a bill of goods. They're selling themselves short. And God wants them to grow up to a man, to a lady quicker than what our society wants them to. And I pray that they would stand up and say, God, here's where I am. And by your grace, I'll be what you want me to be. I pray that there are a number of young people here today that would say that in young adults. And God here is older people. We have so much in our life that hinders us from going all out for you. I've got my schedule. I've got my business. I've got all this junk. And I continue just to kind of see you on a weekend every now and then. God forgive us. God help us to sell out lock, stock, and barrel, sold out totally, completely, and say, God, it's all yours. My life, my all, it's yours. And Lord, I believe when we have that kind of surrendered heart, the journey begins. And what a journey it is. It's wonderful. It's tough. But God, you're faithful through it all. In Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. Man, I